Deuteronomy 6, 1-9. through Now this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you, that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you, you and your son and your grandson, all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. Therefore hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be on your frontlets between your eyes, and you shall write them on your doorposts of your house and on your gates. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. I would like to start this morning by making a, a special welcome for the visitors. We're delighted that you're here, and it is delightful to see you. So please come back and be with us as often as you can. I would also like this morning, before we get started, to wish those who are fathers this morning a happy Father's Day. I hope that your families make a point of telling you today how much they appreciate all that you have done for them and how much they are continuing to do for you. It is said that one small boy on one occasion such as this said, Father's Day is just like Mother's Day, only you don't spend as much on the gift. Well, I hope that's not true. I hope that's not true of you. I hope that you honor your fathers this day. I do know this about you. If you are trying to be the kind of father that God wants you to be, then you have accepted a difficult assignment. Because it is not easy to be the right kind of father, the kind of father God wants men to be in today's society. You know, our world in general does not put a very high value on the concept of fathering. And besides that, being a father, the way God would have us to be a father, requires a commitment of time and resources. It requires a certain amount of selflessness. So those of you who willingly and conscientiously take on this assignment, uh, may God richly bless you. You're to be commended for that. Since today is Father's Day, I thought we might spend some time this morning thinking about godly fathers and how important they are. It doesn't take a lot to be a father physically. It takes quite a bit to be a father the way God wants him to be. He has to recognize and accept certain responsibilities and recognize that God has certain expectations. And that's what I want us to think about this morning is what God's expectations are for fathers. And we'll begin with the passage that was already read for us and make this point that God expects fathers to teach their children the Scriptures. When Moses speaks these words that were just read for us here, the descendants of Abraham are gathered on the east side of the Jordan River on the threshold of going into the promised land, preparing to enter that land after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. And Moses charges the people that they should love God and not forget Him. And they did, as the Lord commanded. After the conquest of Canaan, they settled into the land, they settled into those homes that they didn't build and used those wells they didn't dig. But they placed on their doorpost something called a mezuzah. A mezuzah was a piece of decorative enamel. It looked something like this. And behind that was kept a portion of the law, including the verses that were read for us this morning. As they went through the doorway, that they would kiss the mezuzah. And it was a constant reminder of them every time they went in or out of their house about the things that God expected of them. The men would also strap leather cases onto their arms and inside the little pouch there on that, it was also, again, these same verses. And so this was to be a constant reminder to them that everything that they did needed to be done in accordance with God's law. It's interesting to me that included in the parts of the law that were there for them as daily reminders was the part that said they must teach the law of God to their children. I believe that this shows us just how important this is to God. And I wish I could tell you that throughout their history, the Israelites always obeyed this command from God to teach their children. 
But I can't tell you that, and you know this already, that they did not always keep God's law the way they should. But just because they didn't does not mean that we should not recognize the responsibility that God puts on us who are His covenant people today. In Ephesians chapter 6 and in verse 4, we find these words. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. That is an awesome responsibility. It is an awesome responsibility. But godly fathers will take on this task to teach their children what God says in His Word. They may do it in a variety of ways, but they will always recognize that this commandment is given to them. It's not the primary responsibility of the mother to teach the children the law. It's not the primary responsibility of the church to teach the children the law. It's certainly not the primary responsibility of a, of a religious organization like Florida College to teach the children the law. All these other entities will do some of that. But the buck stops with the father. It's his responsibility to see that this happens. He expects fathers to teach their children. But not only does God expect fathers to teach their children his law, he also expects them to train their children to apply the scriptures. It's one thing to know what the word of God says. It is another thing altogether to put it into practice in our lives. And I think we have numerous examples in the scriptures of men who we might describe as, at least in part, godly men, but somehow or other their children didn't turn out the same way. For example, consider the sons of Eli the priest. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, starting in verse 12, let's read these verses. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. And the custom of the priests with the people... When any man was offering a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand. Then he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. Thus they did in Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Also, before they burned the fat, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, Give the priest meat for roasting, as he will not take boiled meat from you, only raw. If the man said to him, they must surely burn the fat first and then take as much as you desire. Then he would say, No, but you shall give it to me now. And if not, I will take it by force. Thus the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for the men despised the offering of the Lord. We're told in these verses that these sons of Eli were worthless men, and their sin was very great before the Lord. Now, in terms of the particulars of the sacrifice, there's interesting things there to talk about that might be a little bit confusing. They're a little bit confusing to me, but I just want us to think about these sons. Were they worthless men? Did they despise the, the offering of the Lord because Eli never taught them? I don't really know the answer to that question for sure, but knowing what I, I know about Eli and his position, I suspect he did try to teach them. Look in verses 22 through 25. Starting in verse 22, Now Eli was very old, and he heard all that his sons were doing to all Israel, and how they lay with the women who served at the doorway of the tent of meeting. He said to them, Why do you do such things, the evil things that I hear from all these people? No, my sons, for the report is not good which I hear the Lord's people circulating. If one man sins against another, God will mediate for him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who can mediate for him? Who can intercede for him? But they would not listen to the voice of their father, for the Lord desired to put them to death. So here we have Eli who hears some things about his sons that he, he's not happy to hear, and he does make some effort to correct them, doesn't he? He rebukes them. He says, this is not right. He, he appeals to something that they ought to understand. I don't know how much of this happened as they were young, but apparently he was one who tried to tell his sons what was right and what was not. But it says there in verse 25, they would not listen to the voice of their father. And then that last phrase is interesting, isn't it? For the Lord desired to put them to death. They would not listen to the voice of their father. For the Lord desired to put them to death. What I suggest to you is what's being communicated here is that the hearts of the sons of Eli were already hardened against the Lord. And that's why they wouldn't listen and that's also why the Lord desired to put them to death. And at this point, we probably should rightly observe that if a child simply will not listen to the instruction a father gives, it's not the fault of the father. It's the fault of the child. That is certainly true. But we also have to look at what the Lord says to Eli in verse 29. 
In 1 Samuel 2, verse 29, Why do you kick at my sacrifice and at my offering, which I have commanded in my dwelling, and honor your sons above me by making yourselves fat with the choicest of every offering of my people Israel? The Lord says that Eli was honoring his sons above him. Eli hadn't taught his sons to defile the sacrifices in this way. In fact, what we saw there in verses 22 through 25, he tried to correct them. He tried to, to get them to see what was right and to do what was right. But look at what the Lord says in chapter 3 and in verse 13. As he's speaking to Samuel, the Lord says this, For I have told him, that is Eli, that I am about to judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knew, because his sons brought a curse on themselves, and he did not rebuke them. Well, he did. We see a rebuke there in verses 22 through 25 there. That's a rebuke. But what seems to be the issue here, and, and maybe in some translations you have this a little bit differently, the word rebuke there is not what we think it is. It's more likely something like the word restrain. It's one thing to tell your sons, Eli, that they shouldn't be doing these things. It's another thing to prevent them from doing these things, to insist that they do that which is right. Apparently, even though they wouldn't listen to the voice of their father, the Lord understood Eli as being culpable here. You should have restrained them. You should have stopped them. You should have done more. You should have made them, insisted that they applied the word that you've given to them. Well, children are all different. Anyone who has more than one knows that. And while we as parents are always trying to get our children to, to, to do what is right, we have to at times find a way to modify their behavior and their attitude. What I sometimes think about is what lever do I have that will move my child? That lever sometimes might be, might be corporal punishment. It might be a spanking. The, the lever might sometimes be uh, making them sit in a corner for half an hour where they can't do anything at all but sit. It might be taking away some privilege from them. Different children respond better to different kinds of things. But every child has a lever. And as fathers, we have to find it. For my daughter, it was the lecture. She hated the lecture. I would, I would go in there. We'd spend, we'd spend half an hour, 45 minutes. After five or ten minutes, she's begging me for a spanking. Just spank me and get it over with. She hated the lecture, but that was the only thing that would move her. The spanking she'd forget about in two minutes. But the lecture, it was rough on her. But it was what was necessary. Apparently, the Lord understood that Levi had the lever that would move his sons, and he didn't use it. And I'll tell you what, fathers, we can tell our, our children all kinds of things about the Scriptures, but if we don't insist that they live it, we haven't done a very good job of training them. And I think the Scriptures provide other examples of this. Think about Samuel. This is a man who was a godly man. He faithfully served God and the nation of Israel all the days of his life. But it is said of his sons in 1 Samuel 8 and in verse 3, that they did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after dishonest gain and took bribes and perverted justice. From what we know about Samuel, it's hard to imagine that he did not teach the law to his sons, but they sure weren't applying it. Solomon, a man who was given the gift of wisdom from God, he wrote many proverbs that contain highly practical advice on how to live right. He concludes the book of Ecclesiastes in Ecclesiastes 12 and verses 13 and 14. The conclusion when all has been heard is fear God and keep His commandments because this applies to every person. For God will bring every act to judgment whether it is good or evil. But Solomon doesn't seem to have done a good job in raising Rehoboam because after Solomon has died and Rehoboam becomes the ruler, he doesn't have good enough judgment to keep the nations from dividing against one another. And what about... Hezekiah. It is said of Hezekiah in 2 Kings 18 verses 5 and 6 that he trusted in the Lord the God of Israel so that there was none like him among all the kings of Judah nor among those who were before him. For he clung to the Lord, he did not depart from following him but kept his commandments which the Lord had commanded Moses. This is a godly man. Surely he taught his children the commandments of God and how to live right. And yet Hezekiah had a son named Manasseh who was arguably the worst king who ever reigned in Judah. And yes, I recognize it's possible that these godly men, uh, Samuel and Solomon and Hezekiah, that they maybe they just didn't teach their sons at all. 
But even if they didn't, fathers today are still charged to do so. It's also possible that these men did try everything they knew to try, and their sons simply would not listen. We are not given all the particulars about this in the Scriptures. But here are godly men who had sons who were not godly. Some children will harden their hearts against the Lord and His Word in spite of anything that fathers will try to do. And that doesn't alter the expectation that fathers keep at it. It's tragic when children of godly parents are not godly. But when it works, when it works, that is a beautiful thing to see a son or a daughter grow up in the Lord and to be a godly person, one who pursues a knowledge of the Word of God and, and puts it into practice in their life. I want to share a story with you about a father who taught his son integrity. It's found in a book that's written by a man named Bob Welch. I think it was, I don't know, two or three years ago this book came out. But he talks about his son who was uh, in a little league. Apparently it was a seventh grade, eighth grade little league. And so his son was on the young side of being in the seventh grade. On one particular occasion, he's at the plate, and the pitcher for the opposing team is a boy who is on the old side of being in the eighth grade. So this pitcher probably stands about a foot taller than Welch's son. Just huge guy. And he's throwing harder than he's ever seen anybody throw at that age group. And so his son stands at the plate, and the pitcher blazes a fastball down the middle. I mean, strike one. And the father's just hoping his son survives this experience. The second pitch is also a rocket of a fastball down the middle. Strike two. The third pitch certainly unintentionally comes right at his son. His son, of course, falls out of the way, jumps down. His helmet goes this way, the bat goes that way. And it appears as though the ball hit him in the shoulder. So he gets up and he's dusted himself off and the ump says, take your base. And he looks at the ump and he says, it didn't hit me, ump. Now the father, Mr. Welch, is thinking, Come on, come on, take the base, take the base. And the son says, no, no, it really didn't hit me. Uh, son, take your base. No, I promise you, it didn't hit me. He says, okay. <laughs> so he gets back in the batter's box, and his father's just dying over by the sidelines. And the third pitch is another rocket down the middle of the plate, which he hits and gets a stand-up double. Well, the opposing manager of the other team happens to be standing near Bob Welch, and he hears him say these words. Man, you got to love that. <laughs> Here's a kid who could have gotten on first base. It would have helped his team for him to be on first base. But the ball didn't hit him. And he wasn't going to take first base if he didn't deserve it. And so he told the ump, no, no, it didn't hit me up. It really didn't. you got to love that. Application of being willing to tell the truth. Application of being a, a person of integrity. He taught his son that at least. I don't know what else he taught his son, but he taught him that. We've got to teach our children the law of God. We've also got to teach them how to apply the things that they've learned. And a third thing that God expects from fathers is that they be good role models for their children. You may remember that Joshua challenges the people of Israel in Joshua 24 and verse 15 with these words. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers who your fathers served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorite in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about this passage in this kind of way or not, but Joshua is not saying, not just saying, that he will serve the Lord. He's saying that his house will serve the Lord. So this is not just a challenge for the Israelites individually. It is also a challenge for him and his house. It's a challenge of leadership. Joshua's house will serve the Lord because Joshua is going to lead the way. Let me share with you some research that says something I think interesting about the influence of fathers. This is probably about three years old, this data, maybe two years old. Uh, there were a lot of people who were surveyed about parents attending worship services. When both parents attend worship services regularly, their children, 72% of them tend to attend regularly when they're grown. They, they, they go with both of their parents to services, and then whenever they leave home, they continue that practice of worshiping regularly, 72%. If it is only the mother who attends regularly, this drops to 15%. If it's only the father who worships regularly, the number is 55%. It just seems as though, at least among the people who were surveyed, they tended to take their spiritual lead from their father. 
If the Father was there, if He was at worship, then they were going to be at worship. And they saw how important it was. And I will tell you that when I was putting this lesson together, I I intentionally intended to make this point this way. Fathers should strive to be role models. And there are many ways in which fathers might model their behavior so that their children might see and they might be you know, able to learn some things about that. You know, when fathers know their children are listening, they might say certain things or they might give up certain things when they know that there's a point to be made there and that there's nothing wrong with doing that. But it's probably not accurate to say that fathers should strive to be role models. I think it's better for us to understand that when a man makes the decision to serve God like Joshua did, whenever he loves the Lord with all of his heart and all of his might, he can't help but be a good role model. When a man is completely dedicated to God, that's the kind of man a godly father is, he'll still make mistakes. There'll be situations where he doesn't always do the right thing. But when a man is determined to serve God, to serve Him with all of his being, his children will always know where his heart is, even if he does make mistakes. They will always know what the priorities are in his life, even if he sometimes doesn't live up to them. They'll always know what's important to him. And children need to see that in us. They need to see that in us. This will go a long way toward helping children to be what they ought to be. Paul teaches us in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1, Be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. I imagine that godly fathers have this same kind of idea for their children. Follow me as I follow Christ. And to the extent that a man follows God, follows Christ, his children see that and they're taught the Word of God and they're taught how to apply the Word of God, then they will also follow Christ. And is there any other thing that we as fathers desire for our children? Is there any other thing that's more important than that? To see that our children follow the Lord? I'm certain that the answer is no. There's nothing more important than that. The words this morning have been directed primarily to fathers, but I do hope that we understand, mothers, children, all of us, that that many of these principles are universal in scope. Through Moses, God told His people that they should love Him with all their heart and all their soul and all their might. I want to suggest to you that He's still looking for people who will love Him with all their heart and all their soul and all their might. Joshua exhorted the people to make a decision who they would serve. And, And this morning... We are asking all those who have not yet made the decision to serve God, well, why not? Why not? Our Father in heaven sent Jesus, His Son, to die for us so that we might have an opportunity to be reconciled to Him. God is still looking for people who will make the decision to choose Him, to submit to Him, to follow after His will that we find in His Word. And so if you are here this morning as someone who's not yet made that decision, I wish, it was, I wish I knew what the lever was to get, to, to get you to move in that direction, to make that decision. It's certainly your decision. God's not going to force anyone to come to Him. But He greatly desires it. And so do we. God doesn't save anyone who doesn't want to be saved. Sometimes children don't listen to their father and sometimes people don't listen to God. God knows how that is. He sent His Son to die for us. And He tells us to come to Him in faith, to to repent of our sins, to to be baptized, to wash away our sins. And He says if we do those things, then He will save us. But He won't take the choice away from anybody. So if you're here this morning and you're not yet a a Christian, you've not yet obeyed this gospel, then we plead with you. We, We urge you to respond. And if you're here this morning as a Christian and when you think about your life, you wouldn't characterize it as being a life that is one where you're loving God with all of your might and all of your and all of your will and all of your heart. Change that, would you? Take advantage of this invitation that we're offering this morning. And as we stand and sing the song, I want you to answer this question in your own mind. What is it that you want? Do you want to become a Christian? Do you want to be restored to faithfulness? Is there some other way we can help you? Maybe a, a, some kind of a study we could enter into? In whatever way we can help you to draw closer to God, we want to do that. And we'd like for you to think about that while we sing the song that we're about to sing. And we hope that your answer, if you have this need, is I am coming, Lord. So let's stand and let's sing the song. And if we can help you, please, please come forward.